Hi there, welcome to Light From Above. My name is David Kenny. Glad to have you on the program today. Broadcasting from wonderful Wadsworth, Ohio. Glad you can tune in. We're studying in a series of lessons different aspects of being a New Testament Christian. And I'm basing these lessons on a lectureship that I attended at the Memphis School of Preaching. And in this picture here is me with B.J. Clark. Now, B.J. Clark, he's been on our program. I interviewed him. And you can go to my YouTube channel by searching uh, David Kenny Light from Above. And you can find it and watch it if you missed it. You really should you know, listen to him. He's really good. Uh, but uh, here in this picture, he's just been appointed uh, the du new director of the Memphis School of Preaching. And he also gave a lecture. And this particular lesson is based on his lecture. And it's the New Testament Christian knows how to study the Bible. And in that lectureship book, he makes this statement. He says, The state of mind or attitude with which one approaches the Scriptures has everything to do with whether one cuts them straight. One's attitude toward the Word of God may be good or bad, but right attitudes toward the Bible are a prerequisite to understanding its teaching. And that's so true. You know, our attitude, you know, people say you know, attitude is everything. Well, it's not everything, but it's definitely something. You definitely have to have the right attitude about things. And that is a part of effective Bible study as well. Now, let's look at 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, before we look at the major points we're going to make. Paul wrote, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, some people prefer the King James. The King James says, uh, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And, and I love the King James, no problem with that at all. It uses the word study. Well, you can't really rightly divide the word of God unless you study it. I mean, that's, uh, these people that, you know, they just go out and just pontificate all kinds of things. And if you know your Bible, it doesn't take a person very long to say, you know, that's not in the Bible. Matter of fact, we've had press secretaries and presidents be embarrassed because they claim the Bible said something that it really did not say. It was actually some other book or something like that. So, you know, we, we have to be careful of those kinds of things. Study. The American Standard translates it this way. It says, Give diligence to present thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, handling aright the word of truth. And the idea of handling aright has the idea of, of cutting it properly. You know, making sure that you're doing the right thing, everything set up. I mean, there is definite design there. Uh, there's instruction there. And, you know, we, today, you know, we have all kinds of tools to help with that. We have, you know, we have concordances and books and all that. You can, you know, there's great websites out there like ChristianCourier.com, ApologeticsPress.org, and, and others that we can go to and, and read and study. There's great periodicals out there. There might be the Gospel Advocate. Uh, the Spiritual Sword. There, there's great periodicals. Some are better than others, and some I really couldn't recommend, but these I could recommend. But do we take advantage of them? There's great tools online, and we could buy Bible programs to help us. Or you could download even free programs uh, from the Internet, such as eSword, which I, I like to use quite a bit. And there's others. You know, and there's, there's things that, you know, we, we have all kinds of devices you know, some people, you know, they can, they can read their Bible on their phone. And their, their phone has all kinds of apps. Or they might have, a, like I use a laptop. Or my son uses an iPad. Or, you know, we have computers. And we, we, we have all of these devices. We have all these tools. We have all these resources. But is our Bible knowledge any better? Well, perhaps in some ways, in some places, maybe yes. But Brother Clark pointed out that there's a congregation that said that they could be saved within a denomination. 66% said they could be saved within a denomination. Now, a denomination is against New Testament Christianity. Period. I mean, Lutheran. I was in a, um, a series of meetings, talked about church history, and I pointed out the statement that Martin Luther said, don't call yourself Lutherans. Call yourself Christians. But yet, the Lutheran church continues to call themselves Lutherans, in spite of what he had asked them to do. And there's other examples, like Presbyterian, Episcopalian, all, the, all these different names. 
You just need to follow the New Testament if you want to be a New Testament Christian. And that's really all you need to be. But some people seem to make it more complicated. Now, there's some great books that you can study. For example, Guy in Woods has an excellent book on how to study the New Testament effectively. Very good book. Highly recommend it. And there are others, too. There's books by Roy Deaver on ascertaining Bible authority and, and others that you can read. So it isn't the lack of resources. No, that's, that's not really the problem. What's the problem? Well, maybe some of these factors may come into play. Here are the factors we're going to look at. Um, reverently, regularly, reflectively, receptively, and responsibly. You know, these factors all will have an impact on our Bible study. Well, let's start with the first one, reverently. You know, in our nation, you know, we have the Word of God all over the place. I mean, I can go to the Goodwill store and get it. Um, I can go to the public library, and they have free ones on the shelf that, you know, they give away because they have so many. Uh, there's a bookstore that I go here locally in town, and often they have them sitting there free for people to take. Churches, and there's ads in the paper, they just give them. We have the Bible in abundance. But do we read it? Do we study it? Do we appreciate it? There is a day in the Old Testament when the Bible, I guess I should say the Scriptures, because it wasn't the Bible as we have it, in the sense of we have 66 books. They didn't have that many books. Still the Word of God. But they call them the Scriptures. There was a time that it had become rather lost, and people didn't have the opportunity to read and know what the Word of God said. And that was in the days of Nehemiah. Now notice this passage. This is Nehemiah 8, 5 through 6. It says, And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, and he, for he was standing above all the people when he opened it. All the people stood up, and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, then all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Now, that's reverence. And we struggle to get people to just open the book that they carry, you know, they have maybe in their cars and their TV tables, uh, maybe in some drawer. This is reverence. These people wanted to know. Could that have something to do with it? Do we revere the Scriptures? You know, the, the Scriptures aren't, aren't just any writing. They're inspired. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, they'll emotionally move you, although they will. You know, people have different definitions of inspired. But in the Bible, when it talks about the inspiration of the Scriptures, it means God breathed them out. He spoke them. Matter of fact, if you ever look up the words, God spoke, or um, God said, or other type of um, combinations of those words, you're going to find out that the Bible is filled with those kinds of references, that God spoke, that God said. That whole God spoke talks about inspiration. God breathed it out. Now, it's interesting that when I was hearing Brother Clark, and I jotted down this factoid, I'm not sure if it's in the, in the book or not, but I jotted it down because I thought it was sort of interesting. He made the statement that uh, he was at the movie theater and they have those little previews and sometimes they have those little trivia things and factoids. And he said he noticed this factoid. It said the average running time of movies is 30 minutes longer than they were 50 years ago. And he commented on, you know, our sermons are 30 minutes shorter than they were 50 years ago. I wonder if that has a factor to do with anything on this, on our Bible knowledge. Movies, 30 minutes longer. Sermons, 30 minutes shorter. 50 years ago. Think that might have a factor to do with anything? Oh, we, you know, we, we love our sporting events, don't we? You, know, you ever thought about, you ever compared going to a football game versus going to church? You know, you pay a huge amount of money to go to an NFL game. You may have to walk quite a way because you had to park quite a way and pay money to park to get there. You know what? I, I don't care what you tell me. You cannot convince me that sitting in bleachers is comfortable. But people do it for hours. Matter of fact, some person told me that, I looked it up, they said three hours of TV time for a football game. And if they go over, if it goes into overtime, 
you know, people, they just flood out of the stadium. I can't believe that you're playing past the time. No, they don't do that. They don't do those kinds of things. The weather, you know, oh, it's snowing or it's raining or, or it's sun and it's hot. Do these factors fall into it? Do you think there's any parallelism in there about our attitude towards the Bible and, and worshiping God? And yet we wonder why we have such ignorance of God's word today. Could it be that people have actually deceived themselves into using a phrase, it's the hour of worship, which meant and still means it's the hour of the day when worship starts. People have turned that all around now. Now they think that the worship service has to be 60 minutes long. It's an hour. It's the hour of worship. And the rest of the day is up to us. That's the way people treat it. But the scriptures call the first day of the week the Lord's day, not the Lord's hour. You know, so, you know, that, that sort of, it sort of points out to the fact that, you know, some people don't revere God or his word. And so when we come to the Bible to study it, it greatly matters how we are looking at the scriptures. Do we respect them or not? And we should if we're going to want to study the Bible properly. Well, the next one is study it regularly. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 11, it says, These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Now, notice they were doing that daily. You know, I wonder how many people go through days and don't even think about the Bible, much less opening it, much less reading it, much less studying it. You have to do that regularly. It just isn't going to just be infused into your brain. It takes effort. Remember that give all diligence? Study. It's going to take effort. It's going to take work. And it's rewarding work. And so we need to keep that in mind. You know, I like that uh, commercial in, on TV. It talks about, you know, the seat belts. They want you to, you know, wear your seat belt. And they, they ask the, the question, um, you know, what's holding you back? Meaning, if you don't have a seat belt on and you get hit, you're going out the window or something like that. Well, what holds us back from studying the Bible? What's stopping us? Is it lack of resources? No. Lack of methodologies? No. Is it us? Yeah. That's really what it boils down to, our attitude towards about it. Do we study the Bible regularly? Well, how about this one? Do we study it reflectively? It isn't just enough to just read it and meditate upon it. You have to apply it. You have to meditate, think about it, apply it. You have to do all that. In Joshua 1, in verse 8, it says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Now, I want to ask you a question. Now, I might have to repeat, you know, explain some of these statements, because possibly you may not know a lot about the Bible. And there's nothing wrong with admitting that you don't know a lot about the Bible. Matter of fact, that's, that's a trait of honesty. And anybody that comes to our services and they say that and they want to learn more, we try to help them. But one of the things that maybe people have forgotten was this passage in Joshua was given as the Israelites were going into the Promised Land, into Canaan. And Moses and Joshua both warned the people to make sure they read, meditate, and apply God's Word. Or if they didn't, there would be great consequences to it. And that's what would happen. They did not pay attention to God's word. They didn't respect it. They didn't revere it. They didn't read it. They didn't meditate upon it. They didn't reflect it. The kingdom divided. You had the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. They persisted in the rejection of God and his word. The kingdom of Israel would eventually be destroyed by the Assyrians. The tribes were scattered throughout the land, scattered throughout the world. Incidentally, they're not lost. Some religious groups try to teach you they're lost. They're not lost. They're just gone because they've intermarried and all that. They're not lost in the sense of uh, they're in some country like Britain or America or things like that. 
But then you have the kingdom of Judah. It lasted a bit longer than the kingdom of Israel, but it continued to go down the same point, path that Israel did. And the same thing happened to them. They lost their kingdom. The Babylonians came in, took the best of their people to Babylon, destroyed the city of Jerusalem, destroyed the temple. They lost. They did not pay attention to what Joshua had told them. And again, because they didn't listen, the kingdom was divided. Because they continued not to listen, gone. Because the other one didn't continue to listen, gone. I want to ask you a question. I want you to think about it. Seriously. What do you think is going to happen to our precious United States if it continues to ignore God and defame His word? What do you think is going to happen to it? We have people today, they say, oh, it don't matter. It don't matter. Those, and people say, oh, those are just, that's just old stuff. Or you have people who say, well, we can worship other gods. They're just as good. Or they could say, oh, you know what? Um, we need to worship the state. We don't need to worry about religion. Or on and on and on. You know what? I hear people say things today about why they ignore God and God's word. You know where I hear them at? I hear them in the street corner. I hear them on Facebook. I hear them. And you know what else happens? I read about them in Jeremiah. People that ignored God's word and they lost their kingdom. What do you think will happen to our country if we continue this blatant disregard for God and his word? It should be self-evident. The question is, will we correct it? Well, let's go on. Next, we need to study it receptively, and that sort of goes along with it. 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 through 17 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. For instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. In the lectureship book, Brother Clark cited a passage, um, a phrase, a quote from Peel out of the Bible Illustrator. And I sort of liked it. And it says, the trouble with most of us is that we would rather be ruined by praise than saved by criticism. It's hard to accept correction. You know, it's interesting to me that you know, some people, they talk about wanting to improve themselves and they want to make better lives for themselves. And they want to do these kind of, you know what they do? They go to school, they go for training and they, and they have people that explain to them the things they need to do and the things they shouldn't do. And, and we correct ourselves to conform to that teaching so we can improve ourselves. But for religion, for some reason, people just say, I don't want to have anything to do with it. A good friend of mine needs to obey the gospel. He won't do it. Not yet. Pray that he will someday. But he gave me a very honest answer why he wouldn't. And his answer was, I have a submission problem. I don't want to submit to it. That's, an, that's a sad answer, but it's an honest one. And I'm afraid a lot of people have that same kind of attitude towards the Bible. And we need to make sure that we understand it. Now you have preachers out there that try to tell, teach you a health and wealth kind of gospel. If you do what I tell you, you're going to have health in this life, and you're going to have wealth, and everything's going to work out for you. We know what the Bible doesn't teach you. I wonder if those people who teach such falsehoods ever read the book of Job, or even heard of it. The guy had calamity all over the place. But you have people on TV, I see them. Well, if you just listen to me, or you send me a little bit of money, or such and such, such you will have health and wealth. But the Bible doesn't promise such. The Bible teaches spiritual health and spiritual wealth now and in the hereafter. I'm always fond of the statement my father would often say, not all accounts are settled in this life. Some people reject Christianity because they're only thinking about this life. And then when they go and they, you know, they, they decided, okay, I'm going to study the Bible, I'm going to try to follow it. And then when their life doesn't change in this life now, they quit. They said, it didn't help me at all. I have, you know, I'm still divorced, I still have this, I still have that. You have to have a long-term view of things. The Bible and the teachings are not just for this life, but that so you may have eternal life. So don't forget about that. 
That's important. Well, let's go on. You need to study it responsibly. In 2 Peter chapter 3, 15 through 17, it says, they consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. Now, notice here that you know, Peter's writing this, and he's talking about Paul. And he's talking about Paul's epistles. You know, I find that rather interesting. You know, some people, they don't, they don't really like what Paul wrote. Matter of fact, there are some radical feminists that, <laughs> I've heard him say it, they, and I'll be kind the way, you know, the, the language some of them use is atrocious, but they basically just say, I, I don't care what Paul says. But yet they claim to be Christian. See, Peter puts Paul's writings in that statement there with the rest of the scriptures. It's scripture. The, the homosexuals and the same-sex marriage group, they're, they're doing everything they can to get people to ignore what Paul wrote. But Paul's very specific on these matters. may not be popular, but he's very specific. We have to study all the Bible, and we have to study it responsibly. Otherwise, we may be like these people who are are untaught or maybe they're unstable and they do that you know maybe they're untaught they don't know what they're talking about they haven't studied the bible so they come up with things that aren't in the bible you know i think of when i think of that i think of premillennialism premillennialism is a false doctrine that claims so much bible but yet it contradicts the bible over and over again and then you have people that are unstable they may come up with you know all kinds of things that I'm like, well, wait a minute, this does not accordance to the Bible. What, what's going on? You know, people come and they'll tell you, you know, there's another gospel. When Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 1, there's not. So what, what gives? Well, people are untaught, and some are unstable, and some of them twist the scriptures. And they do it in such a way that will lead to their destruction and those who follow them. So we have to study the Bible responsibly. That's imperative. So when we, thought, when we talk about things about factors impacting our Bible study, let's just review them again real quick. We have to have a reverent attitude towards the Scriptures. If we just look at the Bible as some products of men and not the Word of God, then our Bible study will suffer. And we have to do it regularly. It's not something that you could just, you know, the interesting thing is, you know, some people think, well, I read the Bible, I understand it, I'm done. Well, just when you think you've done that, if you ever really did, you change. You can read that Bible for the rest of your life and you will find something in there that will impact you more so than maybe any time in your life. What changed? The words stay the same, but we change. You have to study the Bible regularly. You have to study it reflectively. You have to reflect on what is being presented. And it isn't just a matter of reading and meditating upon it. You have to change your life in accordance with it. You have to receive it properly and respect it and to submit to it. And then when you study, you have to do it responsibly. Now, maybe you think, okay, well, you know what? Okay, fine. But, you know, I still struggle. I, I, do, I like to learn more about the Bible, but what do I do? Well, I tell you, here in Wadsworth, Ohio, we have Bible class at 930 every Sunday morning. We have it Wednesday night at 7 o'clock p.m. We have Bible correspondence courses that we will send you, and you can take, and you can fill them out and send them back to us, and we'll grade them, and you learn and talk. There, you know, it is not a lack of resources. It is not a lack of methodologies. It is not a lack of people willing to help you. The question is, do you want to? We hope that you do. Thanks for watching our program. Before we close our program today, we'd like to take a moment and review this roadmap to heaven with you since the matter is so serious. There are many incorrect set of directions out there and sadly so many people are following them. For example, some people have been given wrong turns. They believe things such as faith only, works only, or grace only. Or some attempt to change the order of the turns, being baptized before they even believe. Some people fail to realize what point they are on the map. 
don't even open their Bibles yet, and they think they're saved already. As a person travels in a car or takes a hike, has to follow the proper directions, so we must follow the proper directions to heaven. Let's take a look at the directions on our roadmap to heaven here. You have to look at these passages in your Bible for yourself. We'll just list the steps, the turns on the way. First is to believe or to have faith. And then number two, to repent, to turn away from sin. Number three is to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Number four is immersion or to be baptized, which is a burial in water to have your sins washed away. And then you're added to the church by the Lord, not by a group of people or not by giving some kind of testimonial experience or things like that. And then once you're added, you need to serve and worship the Lord faithfully all the days of your life. And that, the key word's faithfully. You don't waver. And that's very important. We need to keep in mind, too, that in Noah's day, there was a big flood, and only people in the ark were saved from the flood. The same is true today. There is no salvation outside the Lord's church. Where are you on the road map to heaven? Thanks for watching our program. Please let us know if we can assist you with further information for your journey.